Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I had a subscriber ask a question, which I will flip in here for you guys. And uh, he basically says, hey Jason, uh, what's your take on the difference between sarcoplasmic hypertrophy versus myofibular hypertrophy? Now that is a hell of a tongue twister. So let me put on my plus five out of weaponsmithing. Do a little bit of crafting, and let's talk about this subject. Uh, I think I cover this subject about once a year, probably made three or four videos on it over the years. Um, let's discuss it. <laughs> All right, uh, let's put this in layman's terms. For those, again, unfamiliar with the term hypertrophy, hypertrophy means growth of tissue. When you think of muscle hypertrophy, making gains. Those guns get bigger. All right, that's hypertrophy. Sarcoplasmic versus myofibular. Again, crazy words. Crazy, crazy Latin words. All right, for those who don't know, uh, there's a couple different parts to each muscle cell. Uh, you know, obviously your muscle cells are what your muscles are made out of, just like every other tissue in the body. Sarcoplasm, sarcoplasm is all the gooey stuff inside the cell. You know, you've got the cell membrane and all that goop inside there because we're soft. You know, humans aren't, aren't really that hard to the touch. We're not like steel or rock or anything other than our bones. You have bone cells too, by the way, but they're just encased in this calcium and magnesium uh, composite around them, which is what gives them all that, that strength and structure and hardness. But most of your cells are squishy. They're mostly made of squishy stuff, and it's called cytoplasm. So when we're talking about that, uh, the sarcoplasmic, they're talking about the cytoplasm. So sarcoplasmic hypertrophy would be the growth of all that goop on the inside and all the little organelles and stuff inside of it. You know, there's various little tiny things little machines all inside of a cell is the best way to think of them and all the structure in there and then you have the myofibulars well again the term myo usually lets you know you're dealing with something protein related it's a bunch of protein strands on the ends of the muscle fibers that overlap with the ones on the other cells and they come together to make the muscle contract they overlap and squeeze together and make the muscle contract so that's the part of the muscle that actually contracts and makes the muscle move. So, you know, when you push and lift something, it is the myofibular parts grabbing against each other and pulling together. That's where all the strength comes from. That's the part of the muscle that moves when you train, right? Uh, so we think of that as the, the functional part of the muscle in terms of creating strength. Everything else kind of gives it its structure and, and bulk and everything. Um, and obviously they each grow and they each contribute to the size of the muscle. Well, the reason this becomes a topic is because there have been many people who see these things and they speculate that your training style will influence this. Meaning the idea is that, uh, and they try to do this, and here's the problem with it. Uh, you've got to factor in that your different muscle fibers have different uh, strengths and weaknesses. I discussed that in another video earlier today. We, we talked about that quite a bit. Uh, this are different muscle fibers have different roles but this is the idea is that lifting heavier it's going to cause micro tearing and all those little fibers on the ends and, and when they get thicker and bigger that's what makes you stronger and those are what grow and the metabolic fatigue from doing the higher rep work is going to exhaust some of the fuel supplies and all that goop and it's going to cause it to grow to compensate for that and it's a nice sounding theory if you think that all muscle fibers do the same thing, but that's not how muscle fibers work now, is it? Because your more stamina-oriented fibers produce less force, but they can contract more times, and you have at least 20 different types of fibers going up through the range. And with each type, as it becomes a faster switch fiber, it can contract fewer times before it gets exhausted, but it can contract harder and create more force. So, Obviously, the slowest twitch fibers contribute most to your stamina, and that includes a marathon race. Running a 50-mile foot race uh, is utilizing primarily those slow twitch fibers because your faster twitch fibers can't run 100 steps. They, they're not, they can't do that. They exhaust long before that. You can't work the fastest twitch fibers 100 times in a day. They can't make you your foot or your leg move 100 times uh, inside of several hours. They can't do that. They would exhaust long before that. Uh, the fastest switch ones, you're only going to get a few movements per day out of them, right? Uh, like your one rep maxes, your three rep maxes. But the slower switch fibers can go literally thousands and thousands and thousands of times per day. Um, 
So you see the problem here with this idea because people try to say, well, rep ranges are going to affect this. But they shouldn't. Why would they? Because the same muscle fibers are not working the same. Your stamina fibers all get used, obviously, on your rate coating. Everything goes up the road, right? Whenever your muscles contract, your body determines how much force you're trying to generate to, to move an object or to do something. Now, moving an object could be moving you, right? I'm moving an object right there. I'm moving an object right here. That requires muscle contraction. But that's a very, very, very light weight. It doesn't take much force to move that. It doesn't make, take much force to move my hand or to move my foot. I can do it thousands of times before I wear out because only the slowest switch fibers are involved. But when you need to create more force, your body goes up the road faster and faster and faster. It doesn't skip fiber types until it gets to the fibers that are strong enough to do what you're trying to do, and in which case, if they're not strong enough, if you don't have any fibers that combine together with all the slower ones as it contracts more and more to move a weight, you fail to lift an, uh, an object, right? You're just not strong enough. You don't have the muscle fibers to do it. And you know, if it happens to be a bench press and you get pinned under that bench press, right? That's how it works. Most people get the concept. Well, this idea that they're coming up with of working different rep ranges to do that, but they don't work that way. The really heavy reps will, of course, obviously get to the fastest switch fibers. Exhausting yourself with moderate reps will also get to the fastest switch fibers. When the intermediate fibers further up start to get too fatigued to lift the weight, your body will have to get to those stronger fibers when you start to get a little tired. Because, you know, let's say your, your max is 200 pounds on an exercise or 200 kilos. Doesn't matter. Do we really need to stick to one or the other? The idea is the same. And you go to lift 100 pounds or 100 kilos instead. That's half of what you could lift. All right, you can do that probably seven or eight times before it even starts to feel heavy. You could probably do it 10 times before you start to get the T. So probably until you get to at least the 10th rep, you're not even using the fast twitch fibers, the faster twitch ones, right? Because it, it is stamina strength for you because it's fairly light. That's probably a weight that you could do 15 or 20 times if you had to. So the first 10 are easy. Then as it start, you start to get fatigued, some of those uh, up here intermediate level fibers start to get tired after that 10th rep. They can't quite produce enough force to keep lifting it. So your body will continue that rate coating to get to those faster twitch fibers until when you get to the 20th rep, it feels almost like a one rep max, doesn't it? When you take a, a weight that you, it's like your, your 20 rep max, that's the most you couldn't do a 21st or a 22nd rep, right? That 20th rep feels like a max and it's hitting those muscle fibers. But the thing is, muscle fibers are recruited differently based on load. Now, do you really think that because that last rep is really hard and hit the same fibers that you hit on a one rep max, but because you did 20 reps to do it instead of 10, that it's gonna make the muscle fiber grow differently? It really doesn't. It doesn't make sense when people think of this. And the reason this theory came about was to try to explain why some people are bigger than others, while other people can be stronger than others. That's why this theory originated, and it was said that, well, maybe maybe it's because the sarcoplasm is a bigger part of the muscle cell, and so people who train with really high reps and don't get strong on their one rep max just get really big, and they're not as strong. And the guys who are stronger are only growing the myofibulars, the contractile parts more, and so maybe they're not as big, but they have more contractile protein, so they're, they're stronger. That was what it was trying to explain, but we now know that there's a lot of other factors involved, which I explained earlier today in the video about a bigger muscle being a stronger muscle. So uh, when you think about it that way, this hypothesis was proposed uh, because of that. And the truth is, uh, all the studies I have seen, and I haven't looked back into this recently, but I think I produced a meta-analysis a few years ago, earlier on when I was new to YouTube, um, showing that it actually appears that the rep ranges that you use don't change the amount of sarcoplasm versus myofibular hypertrophy that, that doing five reps or 10 reps or 20 reps seems to produce pretty much the same ratios in the same person. Now there could be a slight genetic predisposition to, to one versus the other just slightly more, but outside of that, the way that you train doesn't actually seem to affect it in any meaningful way. Now I did hear a rumor and I haven't seen it yet. Some people were saying that Greg Knuckles may have uncovered some data that might suggest that training style could affect the ratio of this, but I have not yet seen this, and because of the other previous studies I had seen on it, and when I use common sense and look at it, 
it doesn't really make sense as a theory. So um, all, all things considered, we would need to see, at least me personally, I would need to see some pretty serious evidence that this does in fact occur uh, with a pretty large number of test subjects. Now, if it, it is shown and there's good data showing uh, that is the case, hey, I'll step, probably step and say, okay, okay, I believe it, I don't understand it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but the data is there, so um, let, let's go with what the data is saying, that maybe it really is the case. Um, that I don't know, maybe it is the case that the data is showing it, but in this case, I'm not aware uh, that data has been successfully produced reliably showing that you can train for myofibular versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So that's one of those things that's interesting to know about. It's interesting to know about, but it might not actually be useful to any of us to, to actually know, because if we can't affect it with the way that we train, um, it probably doesn't matter in a practical sense. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.